Did you know that researchers estimate that globally, between 1 billion and 3.5 billion people will need to migrate from their homes just because of climate change? Today, there are 7.9 billion people on the planet. So that's one of every seven people alive today, and maybe as many as half of all people alive will need to migrate because of climate change. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Angel Cruz, and I teach in the Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems major and run sustainable ag education programs for students and beginning farmers all across the state. And for my PhD, I chose to study smallholder farmers, especially in El Salvador, because across the globe, smallholders represent approximately 75%, so three-fourths of the world's farms. And I'm especially interested because smallholder farmers provide around 80% of our food globally. And I'm Dr. Nora Hahn. I teach in anthropology and international studies. And today we're talking about climate migration with a focus on people who farm fewer than 25 acres of land. Angel and I know these people as small holding farmers and the impacts of climate change on their work and their livelihoods will be significant. Nora, I'd like to start off today by hearing from my friend Ricardo, who's a small farmer in El Salvador. Okay, sounds great. Eh, tengan muy buenos días. Mi nombre es José Ricardo Ochoa García. Vivo en Santa María el Banco. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is José Ricardo Ochoa García. I live in Santa María el Banco, in the municipality of San José Villanueva, La Libertad, in El Salvador. I am here with my family. We are five people, my wife and my three kids. Marielos, Diego, and Hector. Thanks be to God, these are rough times here due to the pandemic, but we are moving forward. And here we are to answer your questions and clarify any doubts and to keep talking about this. Now, Angel, you've spent quite a bit of time living in El Salvador. You worked there as an agroecologist, and you studied Salvadoran agricultural practices that could help people face and combat climate change. That's right. That's where I met Ricardo. I met him in 2007. That means we've been friends and working together for over 14 years now. Ricardo is very typical of a small farmer in Central America and in El Salvador that's being affected by climate change. And thus, he's tempted to migrate internationally as a result of climate change. So I thought it would be great if we just heard directly from him as a person living the topic that we're talking all about today. And I work in Mexico with smallholding farmers who are also being affected by climate change, but we both thought El Salvador offers the clearest example of the choices facing these farmers. So today we decided to focus on the country of El Salvador. A lo más el 5 de mayo, en la primera semana, segunda semana de mayo, ya por lo menos ahorita el maíz ya tuviera Casi 30 días de estar sembrado. So what we just heard was Ricardo explaining that typically in El Salvador, farmers try to time their planting to go along with the onset of the rainy season, or else they might face drought or other problems like late harvest. And so historically, they always planted in early May. But in recent years, the rains have been very unpredictable. We talked to Ricardo in early June and still the rains hadn't started, and people weren't able to get their crops in the ground. Sadly, some farmers did plant in early May when they got a few rain showers, but they wasted their seeds, money, and time because it hadn't rained in over a month when we talked to Ricardo. Eh, en nosotros, por lo menos, en, en nuestra actualidad, el año, por lo menos el año pasado, la promesa, well, at least last year, esta, with the hurricanes Ioda, Eta, and Amanda that came through our region, we had cultivated cucumber, tomato, onion, and all the beans that we needed for the family. And yes, it was all ruined. We were expecting a good harvest. We were happy because we thought we would have healthy food, and suddenly it all went downhill we had to start all over again. We had to replant and grow the food again. But we can always move forward and overcome these challenges. 
It's harmful, but the state does not support us. We do not receive funds or incentives as growers, and I admire those countries that support farmers who produce food. Wow, it sounds like Ricardo has already changed his farming considerably. I mean, I know El Salvador is kind of famous for its traditional agriculture built around corn and beans. And of course, El Salvador is famous for the coffee that they grow and that many of us drink with our breakfasts. Well, I can't go a morning without coffee, that's for sure. Ricardo has actually been thinking about climate change and adapting his farming practices for a number of years because he's lost a number of corn and bean harvests to both drought and hurricanes. So a few years ago, he decided to take a big risk and try new farming techniques with vegetables. Most people in his community and his family are growing corn and beans for their families to eat. A few also grow coffee or cacao beans, the key ingredient in chocolate. Even before climate change became a reality for Ricardo, he was looking for alternatives because corn and bean farmers and coffee growers only earn about $2,000 a year, which if you break it down to a month by month, that's less than $200 per month. And Ricardo has a wife and three children to support. So smallholder farmers are typically doing two things. They're growing food for their own families and they're growing food to sell on the market. You know, Angel, I looked up some numbers and I saw that coffee growers in El Salvador only earn about 80% of that government's living wage. And that if I pay $10 for a pound of coffee, just $1 of that goes to the Salvadoran farmer who grew the coffee. That's right, that's a sad reality. Coffee farmers and vegetable farmers, just like Ricardo, don't get to set the prices for their crops. And they make very slim margins that make smallholder farmers especially vulnerable to changes in rainfall and temperature and other effects from climate change. Smallholder farmers are especially at risk of running out of options and then feeling forced to migrate just to survive. So far in this course, we've learned about future climate scenarios. We've learned about the disproportionate ways in which climate and global change affect some people and regions. And we've learned about the ways in which non-human animals respond to climate, among other things. Angel and I will be building on those themes to explain some of the connections between climate change and migration. The links between climate change and migration can be so strong that some researchers have coined the term climate migration. NC State has a robust and thriving immigrant community. Whether we're talking about our provost from Australia, the many faculty members from different countries, or the thousand or so students who arrive to our campus from all across the world every year. These first-generation immigrants are joined by people like Angel and I. My ancestors traveled from France in the mid-1800s, as well as from Ireland in the late 1800s, and I grew up in Pennsylvania. And my grandparents moved here from Cuba in the 50s, and my dad ended up growing up mostly in Florida and the Florida Keys, and eventually moved here to Western North Carolina. He was the first Latino in the county. And in Cuba, my family worked for Mr. Hershey on the Hershey Sugarcane Plantation. Mr. Hershey signed a letter of support for their immigration papers, and because of that, they still love Hershey's chocolate to this day. I love chocolate. <laughs> okay, these migrations are not unusual. People have been migrating ever since, well, ever since there were people. Uh, indeed, people have been migrating for at least a million years. Our human ancestors originated in Africa, then migrated into Asia and around the world. And that's why there are people in just about every corner of the planet. So climate change has always been a part of this age-old phenomenon, but today we see these effects on a new scale. So Angel and I are going to review a few key points when it comes to the complexities of today's climate-related migration. And we'll be hearing from my friend Ricardo again as he tells us why he didn't migrate to the United States, although he did think about it. And he has a special invitation to the North Carolina state community. Ricardo seems like the nicest of people. Our first point is that climate-related migration is a particular kind of migration. Because migration has been part of the human experience for millennia, we know that not all migrations are the same. Migration looks different depending on who travels, how they travel, and why they travel. You know, maybe as a student you've migrated to Raleigh. 
Maybe you'll migrate again by leaving Raleigh in the summertime or by studying abroad for a semester. These sorts of travels are types of migration and ones that people typically undertake on a voluntary basis. The distinction between whether migration is voluntary or not is really important, especially when it comes to climate-related migration. Researchers recognize that climigration is involuntary and generally takes one of three different forms. First, forced displacement. It's the kind of migration that follows a crisis, like when a hurricane makes a region unlivable. Hurricane Katrina is probably the most well-known example of forced displacement that we know in the U.S. Second, we have planned relocations, which is where governments help move people away from an inhospitable setting. And the third is researchers use the word migration to talk about people who move of their own will because they feel they have to. All of these migrants could be termed climate refugees. And smallholder farmers are especially vulnerable to becoming climate refugees, not only because of those slim earnings we talked about earlier. Smallholder farms are often found on marginal land, such as hillsides, deserts, and floodplains. Smallholders also tend to specialize in crops that are not so easy to substitute under changing environmental conditions. That's right, smallholder farmers really rely on good weather just to scrape by. Meanwhile, climate change is having multiple effects, from drought to storms that wipe out harvests to changes in the sorts of pests and diseases. Many of the farmers I work with in El Salvador are located in a region known as the Dry Corridor, where droughts are fairly common even before climate change. In El Salvador, climate change is expected to both decrease the amount of land that's suitable for production and decrease productivity on the land where coffee, corn, beans, and vegetables can still be grown. Of course, we don't yet know all the effects climate change will have in El Salvador and elsewhere. What we do know is that in the short run, climate change is creating lots of uncertainty. And for smallholding farmers, one incredibly important area of uncertainty is the weather. Rain in particular has just become too uncertain to make a safe bet about when to plant. So in part two of this podcast, Angel's going to tell us more about her research in El Salvador and what farmers there had to say about climate change. <laughs>